What's up, cycling fans? Welcome back to another edition of Pack Chatter. I hope this finds you healthy and safe during this very difficult time. We are quarantined ourselves just like everybody else. And during this time, we thought, well, we can do if we can do anything, we can continue to do podcasts. So we're going to keep trying to bring you high-quality cycling conversations with interesting folks around the country. So this one uh, we'll get into in just a second. Before we do, we will talk a little bit about sponsors. It's a tough time to talk about sponsors for a lot of different reasons and, and not because we don't appreciate them. We absolutely do. But just in terms of what they can provide and, and what you can do. But I think it's important just to be aware of the people who are supporting us and supporting cycling in many ways and seeing any way that we can support them either now or in the very near future when some of this slows down. So first, we're sponsored by Once Again Nut Butter. They're a phenomenal company if you're unfamiliar with them. Uh, they've been a great sp- supporter of endurance sports and cycling, and particularly in western New York where they're located, but across the country. They are available across the country, and they produce a lot of high-quality products. Uh, great fuel for endurance athletes, and it tastes wonderful as well. Uh, you can also get them shipped to your house from their website. So this is a really good time to get some really good food shipped to you that's jarred and will last. Uh, they're a good product to have right now. So check them out on their website at onceagainnutbutter.com and you can order some product on there. Support somebody who has supported cycling for a very long time and get a product that will help you through this difficult time. Uh, we're also sponsored by Van Bortel Ford. Van Bortel Ford has been extremely generous and supportive of cycling in Western New York. They've supported our gravel series for the last five seasons and uh, several other cycling events. So although I know a lot of people probably aren't rushing out to buy new cars right now, please keep that in mind in the future as once we get through this and we get to a point where we're a little more stable and you're ready, Van Bortel Ford is a place you're going to want to go and support people who've always supported us. We're also sponsored by Castelli. Uh, Again, maybe not something you're rushing out to get immediately, but as you look to update that cycling gear and that cycling wardrobe, and as maybe you're on your computer looking for some new stuff, uh, check out Castelli. They're one of the oldest and manufacturers of cycling gear in the world, one of the best. They've been innovating for decades and decades and decades, and they'll continue to do so. So if you need some new gear, by all means, hit up Castelli. We're also sponsored by Legacy Bikes. You're probably spending a lot of time home with your little one right now. I know I am. And she is spending a tremendous amount of time on her Strider that we got from my man Todd at Legacy Bikes. We're having an absolute blast riding around the farm. Uh, She's running through some mud. She actually washed it yesterday. If you follow my Instagram at once again cycling or at once again racing, sorry. If you follow my Instagram at once again racing, uh, you can see that in the story feed probably right, well, at least right now as I'm recording this, uh, where she's out washing her little Strider. It's cute. But this is a great time. Spring's here. You're home with your little one a lot. You can order it by mail. So go to LegacyBikes.com and you can order a Strider right there and Todd will have it shipped directly to your house and you'll have that fun during this tough time. And even if you don't have a lot of room outside to ride it around, it's actually pretty useful inside. My daughter's learned a ton riding it around throughout the winter in the house. She has to maneuver it a little tighter and kind of rip around the dining room. And once she got outside in the open space from it, her skill level was way higher than it was beforehand. So even if you're in a smaller area or you can't get outside, the Strider is very useful. Or the Balance Bikes, rather, has several models. Uh, The Strider model in particular is the one that we purchased. And that one also comes uh, with an optional rocker. So it's it mounts onto this this rocker. My daughter calls it her trainer because she gets onto it next to me on her on my trainer at times. And that rocker kind of acts like a little rocking horse for the kids. So it's really good if your kid is maybe under two and or even just at two and isn't quite ready to be on the strider yet. But they can get on the bike, they can climb around on it, they can balance on it a little bit, uh, they can move it back and forth in that rocker and they can get familiar with it before they're ready to kind of launch and rip around on it, which is uh, was really helpful for us because we did purchase it when she was about a year and a half old and she was much too little to actually ride it at that point. But the rocker was a lot of fun for her and she still jumps on it once in a while because she wants to get on her trainer. So lots of good stuff there. You can, use, you can hit up any of those great sponsors 
and show them some some support uh, as they've always supported us in our endeavors to bring cycling, uh, particularly to Western New York, as far as events go, as well as to bring cycling across the country with this podcast. All right, so today's episode uh, is a lot of fun. Uh, it's a it's a guy I've known for a few years now, and we've developed a pretty good friendship, and I have a lot of fun hanging out with him. I see him. Uh, his name is Chris Norvold. He's a young guy. He's about 20 years old. I first met him a few years ago when he came out to one of our events with Jeremy Powers and Anthony Clark as part of a Jam Fund Rider. Uh, he was still, I think, a junior at that time. Since then, he's been to several events, and we've hung out several times and, and always have a good time with it. He's moved into uh, becoming a content creator where he's going to events and creating content uh, specifically for BMC and some other sponsors that he has as a part of his own projects, but it also helps promote the events that he attends. It's a really interesting, fairly new kind of business model that we're seeing come out that's kind of similar to the whole privateer thing but more focused on the content he creates than the results that he has, which I think is a really interesting sort of nuance uh, compared to maybe some privateers who are there uh, more for the results than the actual content that they create. So we had a really good conversation with Chris. Uh, He uh, he and Todd also go way back. Todd actually knew him before I did. He met him through a talent ID camp uh, when he was a junior as well. So uh, we were all pretty familiar with each other and had a nice time catching up, had a nice time talking about some new topics with how to reach younger people in the sport and what it is to create good content and what Chris's goals are in that endeavor that he's just starting and unfortunately is kind of pausing right now uh, because of the events being shut down, but soon enough I'm sure he'll get back to it. So without any more from me, uh, please enjoy my man Chris Norbold. You'll never go out on a training ride and dig that deep. Awesome, we, we won gold. We... They're, they're life rides. I'm like, dude, I'm still figuring this out. I lose sight of the fact that it's it's whoever goes faster. And... You know, this isn't a road race. This isn't a mountain bike race. The sensei of sprint, Todd Shesky. My eyes are coming out of my head. Just get in here. <laughs> so how you guys doing, man? I'm doing great, man. I mean, things could obviously be better, but we're just hanging out, <laughs> honestly. Yeah, no kidding, man. Everybody's kind of everybody's kind of on this this unknown right now, right? I mean, it's just you know, it's. It, I think the biggest thing is just keeping people motivated right now because it's if there's just kind of there's no end point. One hundred percent. It's What's tough up? this time of year too, because like this is the time of year that you're like, okay, I'm done with the trainer, like I can get outside and I'm gonna go on my group rides and my races and all that other kind of stuff. And then it's like, yep, nope, you're not. So it's like, oh, uh, you know, the motivation to get on the trainer is hard enough in in February and January, but like right now when it's kind of reasonable out, man, that makes it way worse. Yeah, definitely. And it's, uh, you know, we're fortunate that we're not, we're not all stuck completely inside. I mean, we're not getting group rides, but, um, you know, I mean, you got a fair number of countries, you know, um, in Norway, one of them is that they're not riding outside. He's in Spain and, uh, he finally, I believe he got back now, but he wasn't allowed to ride outside. Yep. Yeah. I, I talked to a friend in France yesterday who called and, uh, he's the same thing. They can't, they can't ride outside. Uh, and you know, I, I'm not right now either. Cause I'm going to try to start on like my fields and stuff. But like I was telling Chris, I, you know, I live with my, um, my wife's 87 year old or 86 year old father lives with us. And if I get hit by a car or, you know, crash and I got to go get medical treatment at the hospital, I'm putting him at a huge risk coming home. So it's like, whereas if it wasn't for that, I would, that risk would kind of maybe not be as big of a deal to me to go ride by myself somewhere. But even that becomes something that you had to think twice about now as opposed to the way it was before. So I told Chris I was doing loops around my house where there's nobody. It's like rural farm roads. And I got chased by two dogs and almost got hit by a car the other day because there's so many more people out than normally are. Right. Yeah, that's something we see around here. I was out uh, I was out for a ride Sunday and all the parks, man, the, the parking lots are full. Mm-hmm. You know, all the all the trailheads and everything, you know, it's like, you know, and I get, I mean, if people are out and knows are, you know, they're not 
congregating on the trails, I guess. But, you know, you kind of say, hey, man, it's like, you, you know, it's just kind of shifted a whole lot of things. But, you know, there's another part of this whole thing, though, is like, you know, they, they're predicting all a lot of cases. But I mean, up in this part of the state, obviously, I don't I don't. I don't think it is, and maybe I'm just not seeing it. But and when I look at the total number of cases, most of it's concentrated um, down New York City, and I don't think the medical community up this way has really experienced it yet. But you know, I, I, I'm also I'm speaking of not having gone there. I mean, you know, and and seeing what the the caseload is or what's what's really going on there. I, I just don't see any reports of it, at least. Yeah, from what I've heard now in our area, like we're going to see those kind of start to come up here the next week or so if they do, just in terms of like the way people, the timelines of when some of the people who have been uh, tested positive have been exposed. But they're also saying that because nobody's getting tested or there aren't enough tests out there that there's just there might be a ton of people that have it that just aren't showing symptoms and never get any symptoms, which then becomes a weird situation where the percentage of people who die go way, way lower if, you know, twice as many people have it. But at the same time, the death toll could still be, you know, very high just as everybody has it, right? So it doesn't make it less dangerous in that sense, but it does. And that's like, it's a weird sort of way to look at it. Well, it is. And then, you know, there's all these ways of parsing it. And I was reading something recently. It's uh, that there's two strains Um, because you look at like I was looking at Germany's numbers are really low. A mm-hmm. um, lot of a lot of known cases, very low um, fatalities compared to everybody else, like a, like a, a lot lower, not just like, oh, maybe half. It's like, you know, orders of magnitude. You say, so what's going on? Well, somebody's like, well, there's there's two different strains. So, you don't, you know, I don't know. I don't know if anybody really knows what's going on with it. Um, it's uh, it's, it's going to get increasingly hard, though, like you say, is if they start testing or you start getting your arms around it a bit and you kind of say, this thing's less than the flu, it's going to be real hard to tell people, yeah, let's, let's you know, let's keep doing what we're doing. Um, right. You know, well, that's the trade-off. It's less than the flu, but it spreads way worse than the flu. So is it less right. than the flu in the sense that, like, yes, the percentage of people who die are less, but the number of people who die will be way higher because way more people will have it. And right. how does it evolve and how do the strains change and, and those kind of things that become, you know, until people can kind of get a hold on what the treatments look like and and those kind of things. And I don't know the answer to that. It's all kind of like I don't think anybody does. I've been watching some of these press conferences with different governors across the country. And it strikes me that just like every single one of them look completely unorganized and terrified. <laughs> like yeah. like yeah. these look like amateurish press conferences where they just like are saying buzzwords over and over again. Um well, it's and, interesting how they also talk about social distancing <laughs> and how they're all they're all like less right. than six feet away, just standing them behind them. I'm like, hey, guys, social distancing, man. And, yeah. Pretty- yeah, they're all well, touching. They're touching shoulders. And they're like, well, how about we spread out a little bit here? And they're all jamming into these conference rooms. And um, yeah, I don't know. It's a it's. A, you can you can under, certainly understand their fear because anything you do, if it's wrong, you're gonna get you're gonna hang for it, you know. Mm-hmm. So and oh, and sure. it's hard to know what to really do, you know, because it's you know and it's hard when you know three people in you know in an area the size of Western New York, you know, have been deemed having it and with bad consequences. It's like all right, you know, but is it gonna get worse? I, I think that you know this the next week is this next week tells the tale. Yeah, yep, for sure. Yep, I think so. And it's a matter of how disciplined we are. That's what concerns me is I don't think as a culture we're ex- we're very we're very disciplined. We're not good at making sacrifices for things. We want everything all the time. Uh, and that was one of one of the past comments I was watching. One of the governors was saying like like you can't just like do your social distancing for like a couple hours and be like okay that was good now I'm gonna go hang out with my friends like I did my part you know it's kind of like um. The way people approach diets or exercise, like, well, I did it for a couple of days and now I'm going to do what I want and then I'm going to go back to do it for a couple of days. Like, that's not how you get results with something like this. Like, it has to be over a long period of time to see the results come. And that's where you said, like, over the next week or so, we're going to see what that really looks like. And when they say they slowed it down in some of, uh, you know, countries like China and some of those other places, I think as a culture, they're more disciplined than we are. Um, You know, we got people partying on on the beaches in spring break right now. so I don't know, you know, how that kind of affects it, if it is as dangerous as it looks like. 
Yeah, yeah there's there's a couple of interesting things. I was reading this, this article about this guy. Was, he compared it to um, to to dieting. So it's interesting you kind of bring that that aspect out, right? And we look at him and say, you know, if you ask somebody like restrict all these things and basically kind of eat salad. Um, they'll do it if you say like you know for the next two weeks you gotta do this and then you can start having stuff you really like again. People are like all right, I, I, I'm on board. I'll do that. When you tell somebody you're eating salad and they're like, well, how long do I do this? Until I tell you otherwise, they last a couple of days and they're like, dude, I'm sick of this, man. I'm having a freaking candy bar, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know. And and so not having endpoints and it seems like everybody's been really caught off guard, which is odd given the thing's been around since October. Um, right. Yeah. 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 You know, so everybody's no, nobody's really on point with the, like what's what we're really supposed to do. But then you just kind of like here, do this quarantine until further notice. And so it's kind of leads people to say, I, I, I did that for a while. I'm kind of like I'm not doing it anymore because I don't see anything. Right. And so but, it makes it hard. Right. Know? But the way that it comes out is like, you know, it doesn't show anything for, for 14 days as, or sure. as much as 14 days. Like you can't you can't approach it that way. Like you can you can mentally it's the same thing with a diet. You can mentally say I ate the salad for two days and therefore I'm going to lose weight and then go back to eating the way you did. But you're not going to like you're lying to yourself. <laughs> like like right. the actual <laughs> result is not going to happen no matter how much you think it will. Um, right. And but it's having know, it's targets. It's yeah, I targets, think the targets right? are important, right? That's where we lack on the leadership end, right? Is not having the targets or people, you know, the leaders of this have not figured out like what it is and the way we're going to deal with it. And everybody's just sort of reacting to it. Have you guys seen the stuff that South Korea did? I don't know if you guys have, have kind of read some of that or not or, no. or seen anything about it. I have vaguely seen some of it. Yeah, they well, they, they did. They do a lot of they did a lot of testing. I don't know why we, we are, seem to be lacking. Maybe it's just, a, you know, economies of scale that we have so many more people, but they did a lot of testing and then they, then they started quarantining people that were positive. And so they got back online sooner because they were able to, if I understand it correctly, and if somebody could listen to this, like, no, no, you got the wrong thing. It was up there, but uh, there was, you know, some stuff I read and it was several days ago and they were, they did a lot of testing. Then they quarantined people that were positive. And so they took this approach of like, let's find out who, who we need to quarantine and work that way. And then, then those people have an end point too. Cause like, okay, dude, you know, in 14 days you're clear. Right. Right. And that's the thing. Like if everybody were to, we need the test and that's a huge issue. And the people who are in charge and we can blame whoever we want. And I have my own thoughts on that for sure. But like the fact that we were unequipped with tests when this kind of happened, knowing that it had been going on for months in China, you know, it says a lot about how, you know, where we're at, I think. But, yeah. um, but yeah, you can kind of take care of it yourself by doing that. That's basically what we've done. We've quarantined ourselves for the last week plus now to make sure that we don't have any of the symptoms and we'll do it for another week. And then once I know we don't, then we'll potentially go out on short store runs and things like that to to make sure that we're not getting contaminated and trying to be really safe on how we do that. But um, but got to know that we don't have it first by quarantining ourselves for that 14 days. And like I said, the stakes are a little higher for us because if it comes home to my wife's dad, it's way different than if I get it uh, or oh. even if my, my three-year-old gets it, you know? Right. Yeah, definitely. So, but uh, it's certainly shaping a lot of things. I mean, um, now, Chris, you were, you were going to be venturing into some, some new things with gravel and stuff this year. So kind of, you know, wh- how, how was that impact? Can, where, where are you with that? And kind of where were you going to go and how have you kind of changed that whole trajectory where right was i going to go and that's a great question uh so this fall uh bmc approached me and they were like hey we want you to race some gravel which was awesome um i'm super thankful for the opportunity um and we lined up probably about five weeks of gravel racing from the end of march until uh end of april um and that's all been canceled now I'm also a content creator and part of this was to create content around these gravel series. And now we don't have any content to create. Um, So where am I going with it? Um, Hopefully these races will be back on. A lot of them have postponed to the summer. So hopefully I'll get to race some of them. However, I don't expect I can race all of them that were on my schedule. Um, And now it's like, everyone's wondering what the content's going to be like what content can we create to like help our sponsors out what content can we create to like promote cycling and so 
I'm still figuring that out. Um, luckily, I'm in a rich area where I can just go out, ride amazing roads, and film some really cool stuff. So I'll probably end up just doing that, honestly. I'm not even really training right now. Um, I just got back from Texas uh, back a week ago. Um, and so I'm trying to like keep my immune system strong and not beat it down with training just in case I am carrying this. Um, yeah, it's kind of wild. Yeah, so I, I think there's a lot of, and you know, when we started talking about having you on, Todd and I have both known you for a long time. And, and when we first started talking about having you on, I wanted to get into that content creation and you're a young guy and, and sort of the perspective from a young rider and, you know, what you're, what you're attempting to do here as you're beginning down the very be a start of this. Uh, and I think we can still have those conversations, even though you can't really be putting them into play right now. But before that, can you give us a little bit about, for people who don't know you, about sort of your background? How did you get into cycling? Um, you know, where did, how did you get to the point where you're now starting this gravel content creation with BMC? Like, what is, what is the history of that look like for you? So uh, where do we start? I want to include Todd in here. So I think we start probably about five or six years ago. Um, and I got into bike racing through a local shop uh, in central Massachusetts called Gearworks. Those guys got me into racing, um, got me on a junior development team out of Boston called M3. Uh, I was fortunate enough to learn from those guys, go on to another junior development team, uh, which then I went to the USA Cycling Talent ID Camp. God, that had to be five or six years ago now. Yeah, and yeah, that, I think it was. Yeah, uh, I think it was 2015 or 16. Yeah, I think it was 2015. So, I how old are you now, and how old were you then? Just so I was 15 at the time, and I'm 20 now. Okay. So, yeah. Um, so that kind of sparked the road racing. Um, I had gone on to meet at the time I was coached by Adam Meyerson. Um, Adam got me on with Bill Elston's team to race uh, Abitibi up in um, Canada. And that's a, for anyone who doesn't know, that's a pretty big junior stage race. Um, that kind of started to spark the flame, you could say. Um, and going back to Adam Meyerson, he then linked me in with Al Donahue and the Jam Fund. Um, and from there, I Jam Fund took me in and I kind of was able to grow from that. Um, and that's where I met a ton of my mentors now that I have today. Uh, Jeremy Powers, Jeremy Duran, uh, Al Donahue, Makunda, um, Scott Smith. I know there's a ton of other people <laughs> to thank in the Jam Fund. Um, but yeah, those guys kind of took me in and um, Powers actually exposed a really good talent that I've always had, um, which is making videos. Um, so and yeah, that's, so that's where we not to cut you off, but I want to, I want to backtrack just a step there. And then I want to talk about the content stuff, but yeah, that's where I first met you was through, through jam fund. You came with powers to one of my races a few years ago and, and we hit it off and have hung out a bunch of times since, uh, yeah. with that though, I want you to bring us a little bit about Al Donahue. Um, uh, I think he's a, a legend within many circles, but maybe not within every circle that everybody's listening to here. Um, and I know, uh, he had some, some health concerns and, and really people kind of came around him a little bit this winter. Uh, is there anything you could tell us about who he is and the way that he's impacted cycling? So I think he's a really interesting, uh, person. And I'm also wondering if you've, you've spoken to him lately and how he's doing. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, so Al is recovering right now. Um, and if anyone who doesn't know Al doesn't respect him as probably the greatest, they probably should. <laughs> um, he has nurtured so many cyclocross pros, um, Stephen Hyde, Alan Noble, uh, Duran. There's so many of them that came out of the jam fund that Al directly coached. Um, and I'm fortunate to call Al a coach and a friend. Um, yeah, this past December, he had a very serious stroke. Um, and yeah, I, it was really tough. And um, But... He is riding a bike now. Um, everyone kind of supported him. He wasn't doing great probably a few months ago. 
um, there was a GoFundMe started and I believe it raised up over $20,000, which is absolutely incredible. Um, and to Al, that means the world, I'm sure. Um, yeah, it's, it's great. And it shows that maybe not, you maybe don't see everyone with Al every day, but it shows the impact that he's had on the community by seeing so many people reach out, talk to him, ask him if he needs anything. It's just incredible. Yeah, he seems to be, and I, I've never, I guess I briefly met him at the Jam Fund ride last year, but, um, you know, I don't really know him and it's not, I'm not in that Western Mass community in particular, but because he's not one of the big name pros that he's been sort of behind the scenes of, but he's had a tremendous, tremendous impact. So I think he's really well known within those circles, but maybe not everybody outside knows like how unbelievable he is. And I've heard many people mention just how much credit they owe to their success because of the opportunities that he's created. And I love characters like that who, who create opportunities for other people, but don't always get all of the attention, attention for so, it. So there is a great article on flow bikes. It was done after Reno nationals a few years ago. Um, if you just type in Al Donahue flow bikes, it's a great article to show what he does. Um, and how, yeah, how, I'm trying to think of the word, how selfless he is, how much he gives to other people. Um, and it kind of just portrays in that article. Um, yeah, he's, and he, he has shaped the way I ride a bike, which is incredible. Like, probably when Todd saw me at USA Cycling Camp a few years back, I was just like, I just wanted to get it done and I just wanted to go ride my bike um, and just go train. And Al kind of showed me the fun behind riding a bike again. Um, there are many legends of the vision quests he has led. And for anyone who doesn't know what a vision quest is, it's basically going out in the woods um, for hours upon hours, typically this time of year on gravel cross bikes. Um, and we just go adventure all these like secondary dirt roads and like mountain bike trails and yeah, all these hidden roads that you can find in Western Mass. And, you know, he showed the fun in that and for I'm forever grateful for that because that sparked a new kind of adventure in bike riding for me, not just racing. Yeah, and those are those are some key things too, and uh, you know, and I think it can get lost, especially when when people are younger and they and they really want to achieve in the sport, and um, you know, it, having the time where you just enjoy the process. Um, and I try to emphasize that to guys a lot of times. Is just you know, there's days is like, just, dude, just go out and just just have some fun on your bike, exactly. you know, and it's especially in the off season it's like you know sometimes people get they're they're turning season on top of season right like well they're they're going from especially these days you know, in the last 10 15 years with cross coming up so heavily you get a road season that now has blended into a cross season typically uh, of course this year is going to be a, a different scenario but um you know, typically this by the time we get this year, <laughs> cross season might be cross road, gravel, everything all at once. <laughs> it's yeah. going to be overlap. Everybody, right? Everybody's going to slam everything into uh, September and October if we're lucky. Right. I mean, but but usually, you know, now you've got the, like, you know, gravel's kind of taken on to the spring end of things. Right. And then people finally start coming around to like, OK, it's road because it's nicer out and it's, you know, it's it's the end of April, May. And then by July, it's all you hear is cross is coming. Right. And, and, and then by by the end of August, it's, you know, cross is kind of full on already into September. And uh, and you kind of roll into that. And that takes you up until even in this region. Um, it's a heavy schedule until about Thanksgiving. And then it's kind of like, wow, you barely have time to turn around and it's oh, we're coming back around again. Exactly. Um, and, and, and with the all the positives of of power meters and the knowledge about training that's been developed over the last uh, 10 to 15 years, which has been great. The it's, downside is also that people stopped having fun. Exactly. Exactly. So, like, dude, Al just would take us on these miserable rides and like when i tell you miserable i mean like i've been hypodermic afterwards um <laughs> i kid you not 
uh, probably there's a picture on my Instagram a few years back and Al took us on this vision quest that we ended up crossing a river in like <laughs> right. late March. We ended up crossing a river. The bikes were on the shoulders. Everything was, <laughs> everything was wet. <clears throat> it was wild. And it was like me and like a few other teammates. <laughs> oh, it, yeah. But those are those are those epic kind of rides, right? See, so you still tell that you don't tell the story about how you went out and did uh, eight sets of VO two max intervals, right? I mean, it's kind of like, oh, all right, that was cool and everything, and got me strong. But you know, doing some of those epic rides, I mean, for remembering why you love cycling. Right? Yeah, it's like it's the reason we do this, and like, so now I guess this also goes back to your earlier question. Uh, what am I getting trying to show with this content now? Like, yeah, I had the plan, but the p- plan fell through, right? There's no gravel racing in April, right. obviously. Um, so I want to show some of those vision quests and those kind of epic rides. And so that's that's my plan for the next month is to film those and hopefully make them come out pretty good, uh, kind of tell the story. But yeah. Um, that's cool. That's a cool idea because I think – you know, hopefully if we see sort of a trajectory on this where right now we kind of need to be really cautious and then maybe I, I hope we kind of ease back into things and we don't just sort of turn the, the water on full blast again and just see what happens. Um, we might do that as a society, but hopefully we're smarter than that. But if we're if we are kind of easing back in, that might be how people are riding now because there's a lot less to do. So they just want to go out on these long rides with maybe small groups of people uh, to start. So that's kind of very a, t- a very timely thing to to sort of present to people, and I love the to the term vision quest for that. Obviously, that has that carries its own connotation through other other cultural issues, but kind of taking that and and applying it to where you were talking about with Al, that's a really cool way to think about it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, so that's that's that. Um, Al is doing well. He is posting actually on his Instagram right now. Um, and they've been doing Zwift group rides. Um, I don't believe Al's allowed to ride outside, but he is riding Zwift. So if you guys are on Zwift, go ride some bikes with the Jam Fund for sure. Cool, very cool. So let's talk a little bit about the content. You know, aside from what we're dealing with right now, uh, more about like what you were planning and doing, and hopefully what you'll get back to doing. Uh, I think you're at a really fascinating point as a as a 20 year old uh, racer, uh, somebody who can very much help us, uh, sell the sport to your peers, which I think is really important. And we try to interview quite a few young riders on the show for that reason. We want to bring younger people in. And and I think one of the ways to do that is to show them younger people who are doing it and, and sort of showing them what do they like about it? Cause they can identify with that. So and you're also doing a kind of this new, I don't know if you want, you're calling it a privateer thing, but, but this new kind of concept that's, that's coming out, particularly with gravel with privateer, that's creating different opportunities than if you were a 20 year old racer 10 or 15 years ago. So what is it about the contact that works with your generation and what are the opportunities that you're trying to take that are different than people who've come before you? Yeah. So, uh, let me just backtrack actually to how I got started in the content, um, you know, probably before cycling, uh, so probably when I was 10, between the ages of like 10 and 14, um, I wanted to be a meteorologist. And you wanted to be a meteorologist at 10? Yes, I did. Okay. I don't, this, you tell, I don't know if you should tell people that, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> and so this, is the, this is the real I, content. This is the yeah, real content right here. This is ten year olds want to be like football players and like firefighters and no, so I just wanted to be, to be a meteorologist. Uh, <laughs> and I had a full on green screen set up, and I taught myself how to use all the video software when I was 10, 12 years old. Um, so I've always known how to do it. Um, and when I was on Jam Fund, um, Powers was having behind the barriers. Um, and he showed the importance to me of why behind the barriers, one was so successful and how it kind of portrayed um, cycling. And 
I think if you talk to any young cross racer, um, behind the barriers is the reason that they got into cyclocross. I know that's for my case as well. Um, so I know the importance of why we're doing this. Why is it content? Because we want to get more people into the sport. Um, and when you talk to people about road bike racing, they're just like, oh, yeah, you're just out on the road. But we're doing cyclocross and we're doing gravel. We're doing these gnarly, sick adventures on bikes that probably aren't made for it. And so telling that story is really crucial. And like, if I get a few people into the sport, that's a job well done for me. If I sell a few BMC bikes, that's a great job done for me. That's, yeah. So the importance of this kind of content definitely was from Powers, um, but you see the rise in gravel racing. And I think it's a much more accessible sport. It's a much more inviting atmosphere. Um, it's kind of a cyclocross vibe. And like, if you look at Tony's races, Tony's races are just so freaking sick because you can talk to anyone, you can go up, you can have a conversation with any hundred, you guys get what, like two, 300 guys out usually? Yeah, we yeah, we're usually between that number. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. You could literally go up to anyone at his race and just start talking to him. And like, that's, that's the rad part about this kind of community. Um, so yeah, I, that's where I came from and like how, why I'm doing this. Um, but the plan was to go to these gravel races. Um, this week, actually, I was supposed to be at a gravel race in Connecticut and I was getting race a gravel e-bike <laughs> um, because nice. they had an e-bike category and I was uh, the new BMC road e-bike can actually fit 40 C tires in it. So <laughs> when they presented me the opportunity to race this race, I saw there was an e-bike. I was like, yeah, maybe, maybe we race e-bikes. Um, so there were going to be all those kinds of cool, like niche videos. Um, just so like for, stuff. Yeah, and I'm glad you're talking about those kind of things. One, the you know, the influence of powers. I think that that's huge, and we were lucky enough to talk to him the other day about some of that stuff, and nice. the way he influenced the generation uh, to show them how important it is to create media to influence the sport. And we're seeing that come with all kinds of people now. Kerry Warner's got a great vlog that's that's very popular. That's kind of the next generation of that, and and there's all kinds of other people doing it as well. Um, but some of the things you touched on here where I really want to get into that generational uh, vision here. So you have those influences and that natural intelligence with the technology. So how do you then translate that into messages, I would hope, particularly focused at people your age? Because as much as you say this is accessible and it gets a lot of people in, and I agree with all of that, uh, the numbers, though, the people that are coming in are pretty much you know, at least 10 years older than you, if right. not 20 in a lot of cases, as far as the, the most, the majority of them. Um, so I think gravel is accessible, but it's also reaching a little older demographic. I'm also not, not just, this is a little side point, but there's also a lot of gravel races that are just ridiculously long and they call themselves accessible. And I just have a hard time with that <laughs> argument. <laughs> like it's cool. And, like obviously a lot of people want to do is it. My, this is going to be my hot take for the day. I might get in trouble for saying this. Kansas is not accessible to everyone. No one can go out and do Kanza just to do Kanza. Kanza, right. it's hard. Like it's drawing in, it's drawing in riders for sure, and that's cool, and it's not taking anything exactly. away from it. But exactly. when we're talking about bringing new people in, particularly new young people who need to build at least build toward that, they're not going to do two hundred miles for their first ride. The no. media is a aside from the event tangent. The media is a way that kind of captures their attention. So. What kind of media are you finding that your peers are drawn to? And you kind of touched on it with like the adventure riding, maybe being more interesting than than road racing. So when you're putting together content, yeah, are you thinking about a particular audience? Are you thinking about a young audience? And what are some of the things you think the, those audiences want to see? For sure. Um, so I'm lucky enough that I'm in this audience dem demographic that I'm marketing to, <laughs> truthfully. Um so I create the stuff I want to create. Um, 
and I use a lot of relevant music, uh, which I think captures the viewer pretty well. Um, and I'm definitely keeping it younger. You won't see me, and like sometimes you'll see me with like some older people in these videos, but you probably won't see anyone above the age of 40 in these videos, truthfully. Um, Sorry, Todd, you're out of the video. You're right. I can oh, still man. do it, though. I'm still in. <laughs> are you there? A little bit more time. How old are you, Tony? Are you 37? I'll be, I'll be How old are you now? I'll be 38 in a couple days. Heck yeah. Happy early birthday. Thanks. Yeah, so I'm, I'm under the 40, so I can be in Chris's videos. Todd, we'll call you later. I, I just barely missed it. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, but I, I think that's important, right? You want to you want to show, show young people doing, doing it if you want them to do it, right? So it's exactly. not just like oh, I don't want to ride with anybody because they're such and such an age. But it's if you show a bunch of guys in their forties and fifties doing it and go, hey, try this. Uh, a twenty year old isn't necessarily going to exactly. jump onto that. You know, you got to show them something of themselves, right? So that, I think that's a great a great technique. You're talking about music. Um, what about like durations or scenes? Like what is it that you try to focus on, particularly when you're on that editing phase? Like what are you, what does that look like for you? So uh, in an editing phase, a lot of these videos I plan out pretty meticulously. I've done a lot of these races before. So I, I have all these plans. And I know how I want to cut each scene. I know how I want it shot. Um, but to go along with that, um, I think our attention spans are getting shorter. And so our attention spans, I can't watch a video longer than five minutes unless it's on Netflix, truthfully. Yeah. And this was probably my biggest critique on the behind the barriers was it was way too long. Um, at least when I was working for Jeremy on behind the barriers, the last two seasons, um, I was doing some marketing for him. I was like, man, these are so long. Um, and so I was fortunate enough to, um, work with Ellen Noble this fall on some video series that she was doing. Um, I got to see the analytics behind everything and I definitely, I learned a lot. Um, and I think the shorter, the better you'll retain the most viewers. So that's where I'm going for. My main philosophy is if something's not interesting every 10 seconds, then it's going to be a bad video. Now, does that, does that change with the types of videos? Because I'd be inclined to agree with you uh, on most of it, but I, I feel like particularly maybe with behind the barriers, but um, with those attention span issues that a lot of times if there's a narrative that somebody can kind of dig into, which is if you sit down and watch behind the barriers – Almost after there's the fact, a very good story right? behind it. There's those a- those narratives kind of draw the longer ones, right? But if you want to make something that's just like, hey, check out this ride I did. There's no real continual story. It's just like this was gnarly. Then you've got to be punchier, faster, shorter, right? Exactly. exactly. And that's the kind of storytelling I do best. Um, yeah, it's that's truthfully what I've been doing, and. Um, I got to see the analytics. I got to see where viewer retention ship drops off um, throughout a time in a video. And it's really, really interesting uh, in that kind of sense. For what sure. were some of the drops you were seeing? Like where, where would you see the typical drops in time? I would typically uh, see it around the eight minute mark for sure. Uh, you'd see a little, you'd see a like ever decreasing trend downward uh, from the start of the video down to eight. Then you'd see a pretty significant drop after eight minutes. Um, that is based on a lot of videos I've worked on or have access to. Um, Interesting. So like right. eight minutes seems to be kind of a, a cutoff point. So I noticed if you watch, I really like those ones that EF put out last year. Uh, yeah. on some of the events and they hit like 15 to 20 ish, which I thought was kind of a good mark just in the sense that, um, it had that little bit of narrative involved. Uh, it wasn't just sort of highlights, more. right? Just so you know, they hit a lot more viewership. That same video was put out on Rafa films and has mm-hmm. 150 K in views. All of those. Yeah. Um, those, those were, I thought those were really cool. Ted King, uh, did you watch the rift one he did? 
Yes. Um, and I actually know Ansel very well. Ansel's the yeah. guy who, Ansel's a former pro road racer uh, turned media guy. And he's been doing such a good job. Um, I really, I got to say, Ansel's killing it right now. Um, and I thought Ted's was really good. I really like the EF vibe. Um, mm-hmm. I think that vibe, it shows the people what they want to see. Like, no one wants to go to some serious freaking event, you know? Like, you just want to go out and have fun. And that's what those guys are doing. Like, yeah, Kansas is ungodly and hurts a ton. But those guys were having fun during it. And they made the storyline fun, which I think is crucial in uh, creating videos. You got to make it fun. No one's going to watch it if it's not fun. Yeah, and I think there's a part of that, um, you know, when you talk about kind of these timelines of, of what works in short stories and narratives, um, there were some things that when I worked with uh, with Scott Page early on and putting on the uh, the Rochester Crip and and working in the uh, on the production part of getting a promo video and something that I've always kind of taken away from that and talking to the production person was it's better that somebody wants to watch it twice and somebody turns it off early. Exactly. You know, and so you kind of put it in your head of like, I'd rather people get done like, wow, what was that? I'm going to watch that again. Then they're like, yeah, you know, I, I, yes, I, it's more of the same. I've kind of seen this for the last four or five minutes, a click, you know, and they're gone. And then they're less apt to share it. They're less apt to, to be excited about it. But if somebody's like, wow, yeah, rewatch that. That was good. Um, leave people kind of wanting a little bit then overwhelmed with like, yeah, it was just kind of more of the same thing. It wasn't all that great. Um, unless you can have those longer narratives. Um, yeah, for sure. Um, which is, yeah, which is harder to do, but definitely, um, definitely a higher level skill. But I think you're, you're hundred percent right on that, Todd. And it, it reminds me of, as I've started to do some more of this with some of my events and, and even the show a little bit, one of the things when you're creating it for yourself, as opposed to like hiring somebody like Ansel to say, Hey, I'm going to do this Will you follow me and, and make it for me. Who's a pro number one, but two has that outside perspective is they can see it a little differently when you make it yourself and you go on this ride or you're marketing this event, like you think things are important that might not be important to everybody else. You're like, Oh, I, that one section was so awesome. I got to show it. And so is this other right. section. And so is this other section. Right. Yeah. Well, <laughs> it's, it's your, your baby, rest. right? Right. Well, it's right, your, it's right. your baby. Nobody wants to call their own baby ugly. Right. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Instead yeah. of going, okay, those are all things that, you know, that's shown 12 times. I don't need that. I can show that once. And it's essentially the same every single time, but that's where in this new world we're in getting people like Chris and some of these other content creators at your events and and in, and part of what you're doing and having them bring that content and that outside experience makes for a lot better content as much as it's kind of fun to create your own too you know for sure for sure yeah it's it's cool um it's interesting how i'm shooting while actually trying to race a bike as well um yeah it's it's cool it's cool well, it actually so adds this, this dynamic, right? Because you, know, you you've kind of a you've kind of got a little bit of a split mind out here, right? Um, so you're doing some of these races, and like you said, you're shooting at the scene. So naturally, you're not just racing; you're also looking for how is that going to frame in? How is that going to look? I'm I'm sure I know I would. I, that's what I'd be doing. I'd I'm be typically thinking, not you know. looking at that while I'm racing. I'm going to be honest. Um, okay. Typically, it's like before race shots and after race shots. That's what people want to see. Like, people want to see you race, but like, they want to see the story behind it. And a lot of the times, the story is before or after a race, um, which I think you saw a lot of in Behind the Barriers. And so, typically, I'll run a GoPro on my bike. Um, and honestly, it, it stays framed whenever, wherever I put the bars, you know? Um, right. And sometimes like Todd or sorry, uh, sometimes at Tony's races, uh, you guys have media people there mm-hmm. and, you know, being able to like give some of the footage before and after a race to you guys for your use and kind of allowing me to take some of that footage from the race is it just mutually benefits so well. And yeah, which is which is what for people don't know, which is what we were planning on this year before we had to start canceling stuff was Chris has obviously been out before. He's planning on coming out again 
Um, and he was going to do some stuff for BMC and do some filming. And we would have people there hired to, to do our event as well. And we were going to work on some exchanges and cross promotion. Uh, yeah. I think you were scheduled to come to the last one and that one's still on. So hopefully we'll still be able to do that this year, but if yeah, not, you know, we'll do it with another project. I'm sure. Yeah. Oh, dude, you know, you know, we'll be working on projects for a long time. Definitely. Yeah. Do you, you know. do you see, uh, do you see, uh, interest or, or, um, what's kind of your marketing arm as far as small events? I think, you know, Tony's a little bit unique in, in kind of really, uh, pushing more of the the social media and the uh, the content part of it and folding content together, um, you know, with 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 pack chatter as part of that, but also with you know having you part of it, having Jeremy part of it, and and looking for those ways. Do you, do you see other promoters, smaller promoters, getting on board with what you're doing, with Ansel's doing, and those things, or are they kind of like, no, nah, dude, we got nothing here, and they're not interested, or where where do you see them falling? Because obviously promoters are a little bit older, typically yeah. like my age. So. So. I mean, like, like over 40. Uh, yeah. <laughs> like Richard Freeze wanted me at his event, which is go- was supposed to be this weekend uh, with the e-bike category. Um, and Richard's 40, maybe 50. Like, yeah, at least. <laughs> Come on, dude. You <laughs> <laughs> but but I'm Richard sorry, Richard's very Richard. Richard's very up on things though. He's he, Richard's a much more progressive well, and and an opportunity seeking person than than your average promoter. I think for sure. Well, and for sure. and Richard has a media background too. I mean, I like for you know I don't do it anymore. I do this now as part of that exercise. But I started in journalism uh, before I started teaching, and that kind of turned me on to a lot of the ways that I see this and the way that I promote things. And Richard started with a, with a cycling magazine. So he understands, even though it was a different format, he understands the, the importance of media and the way that that can help promote events. Right. For sure. So that's what I was going to do with his event. So you see those events and like Raspi Tietz is another one. Um, Well, one, I'm getting plugged my sponsor now. (laughs) Um, Garneau is a big partner at a, at Raspi Tietz. Um, so Raspi Tietze was stoked to have me come up and hopefully I can still come up. They rescheduled. Um, yeah, there all these events that I had planned. Like I reached out to every single race promoter that I was planning on coming to. I reached out to Tony. I reached out to Heidi and Anthony at Raspi Tietze. I reached out to Richard and all these guys were super, super uh, responsive to everything. They were like, yes. Absolutely. Whatever you need. Um, and I'll throw in the Paris Tancaster guys as well. Everyone's super, super stoked on what I'm doing, which is honestly it's gratifying to know that. Um, it really, it makes me feel good that I have a good support network um, where race promoters are like, yes, absolutely. Come do this. And just getting that like immediate yes response is just so gratifying. <laughs> Yeah, and I think I think seeing you know everybody realizes the you know the landscape is changing. Um, sometimes smaller prom- promoters, you know, just because of budget and and uh, you know just not having um, the time to really to do it. Uh, if you're able to basically plug in and provide kind of really easy value for them, um, that makes it a, that makes it an easier sell, if you will, because they really say, look, I have a low low upfront investment, but I can stand to gain a lot. And as they think, as they see that as a wow this really does help my event um and it's and it is it's good for growing the sport but it's uh beyond i think just beyond the the bounds of of people that um per se want to race um yes from a participation but also from just a general interest and spectators and the whole industry i think benefits from people like wow that's really cool that's fun i want to be part of some kind of that thing and like you know we've had richard freeze on the show before and you know one of the, one of the big themes of that was you know get more butts on saddles you know mm-hmm. and when people see Various aspects of the sport is being fun, whether it's gravel, it's road, it's cross, it's track, whatever it is. And they're like, wow, that was really great content. It looks like something I want to do. Um, and you're able to be on the forefront. I think it's really cool and get people to embrace that early. Um, For sure. You know, is 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 huge, but but Richard's Richard's an anomaly on a lot of things, and uh, yeah. But <laughs> right. well, and I think to your earlier point, Todd, you know, when we talk about. Uh, the difference in resources that, you, that you're mentioning now, uh, you know, you mentioned Rasputista or Paris Ancaster or Richard, yeah. they all have 
way they, more resources than what I have exactly. as a small grass, you know, much smaller grassroots promoter. So I have to be much more creative in terms of being able to afford it. Cause like Todd said, you don't have the budget and a lot of small promoters, you know, they reach out to somebody who does this, uh, who's looking to make a living doing it. And they go, okay, they quote them five, $6,000, which maybe that investment returns the next year or the year after the mm -hmm. year after, but maybe not. And they don't have yeah. the money to begin with, but pairing up with somebody like you, who's doing it on a, from a different perspective and has sponsorship that's helping fund it and you're feeding your sponsors while helping promote those events is exactly. a way that those smaller events can afford to do it exactly. as opposed to a bigger event that contracts somebody to come in uh, on a budget that, that we couldn't afford. You just hit that directly on the nail. You, yeah, you took <laughs> it from my mouth. Perfect. <laughs> All right. So, uh, Unfortunately, we, we got to wrap up. We could do this all day and we'll definitely do it again. And, and you and I will definitely hang out uh, very soon once all this stuff ends. No, and get the, some I, no I'm so mad our trip got canceled. I'm so mad. I know. We always look forward to having you guys down every year. The last couple of years, it's been a ton of fun. Uh, you guys come down and stay with us and, and we hang out quite a bit around the races and have some good stories that we won't tell today, but maybe we'll tell someday <laughs> around some of those adventures. <laughs> some of those stories should be That's told. true. Like, well, some of them we'll have to put on a put on a separate uh, separate uh, re restricted viewing, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. But yeah. uh, but but Chris, do you have a you you have a site, and uh, I'm sure you know, yeah. Tony can have some links and and you know links to some of your some of your work, um, so we can you know people can get a flavor for what you're doing and uh, um, and kind of dig into it. Especially like a lot of us hit you know, especially a lot of people riding right now. I mean, we're we're doing some extra content, and uh, this is a great time for you to roll some extra content people are looking for things that are sitting on zwift so the most um the most used social media channel is instagram uh follow me on instagram at chris normald um i have facebook i have twitter don't really use it much <laughs> truthfully um but you can also find all of my work uh at chris and you can find my work you can find my sponsors you can find anything you need to find about me so yeah very cool. And that's a good awesome. note for you older older promoters out there who want to know where to find these these kids. Well, they're on Instagram. So there you go. I Facebook advertising and Instagram, man. All right, man. well, Chris, it was great, great talking to you again. And I uh, hope to we'll catch up with you time. soon. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Very good. We'll talk. Stay safe, guys. Yeah, guys. Uh, you too. All right.